Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our board executive committee meeting of the East Bay Regional Park District. It's Thursday, June 4th, and we are starting the meeting at 1231. And I would like to ask the committee secretary to please take the roll. Okay, this is Becky Fang, recording secretary, taking roll. President Ellen Corbett. Here. Director D. Rosario. Here. Director Ann Wieskamp. Here. Okay, now I would like to read the names of Park District staff participating in this meeting. General Manager Robert Doyle, Deputy General Manager Dr. Ana Alvarez, Assistant General Manager Christina Kelchner, Assistant General Manager Jim O'Connor, Chief of Design and Construction Lisa Gorgian, Chief of Stewardship Matt Graw, uh, Capital Programs Manager Ren Bates, and Planner Chantal Alatore. Thank you very much and welcome to everyone here attending from the Park District and any of our public who are joining us here today. Uh, today's board committee meeting is held in accordance with Governor Newsom's executive order, allowing for board members to participate in standing committee meetings remotely. We are providing live audio and video streaming and have provided the public the opportunity to email or call in prior to the meeting with public comments. The information for that can be found on our agenda and is posted on our website at edparks.org. And um, do any committee members have any questions about the meeting process before we begin? Nope. Okay. And do we know if we have any uh, uh, members of the public joining us today? Not that I am aware of. It's just staff at this moment. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let's go ahead and start with the agenda. We have um, two main items today. And the first one is our Hayward Shoreline Adaption, excuse me, Adaptation, <laughs> as we adapt, Master Plan. And that presentation is by Matt Grawl. Good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Director Corbett. Um, oh, sorry, AGM. No problem. <laughs> Oops, can't hear you. Can't hear you, Christina. Still, still not working. Frustrating. There we go. Now? There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, okay. thank you. Christina Kelchner, AGM of Acquisition, Stewardship, and Development. And um, this presentation today will be uh, first provided by Brian Holt um, and then Matt Grawl. Uh, Brian Holt from Planning. This is a, a joint project between planning and stewardship and uh, has been going on for quite some time as we all um, look beyond the current crisis, which of, of which there are many we are facing, but the longer term um, crisis we're facing, climate change and sea level rise and looking at what some of the options might be for um, interagency work to uh, start to figure out how we adapt to the sea level rise that is coming at us. So I'll turn it over to Brian Holt to give an introduction. Okay, thank you so very much. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to share my screen here. So let me go ahead and find the presentation that I just had opened up. Oh, Brian, I got it, sorry. Uh, okay. Let me just run with it, Matt, because I've got it up here. So okay, we're okay. uh, Beautiful photo. talking today about the, uh, the Hayward Shoreline Adaptation Master Plan. So uh, as uh, Christina mentioned, um, sort of shifting gears from one crisis to the other crisis that we still have going on. Sea level rise is still very real. Climate change is real. So um, we continue to plan for how we can adapt for that. Um, so uh, as you are all aware, uh, the Park District, uh, we manage um, roughly 50 miles of shoreline uh, throughout the East Bay. Um, this shoreline uh, protects um, and uh, is adjacent to um, significant pieces of infrastructure, transportation, housing, um, and industry. 
Um, so we're very aware that a multi-jurisdictional response is necessary. This is a, a, a challenging and, and will be an expensive um, uh, a response to, to uh, adapt to climate change and to sea level rise that will require a really all hands on deck approach uh, in terms of uh, responding to this. And uh, the Park District is very, uh, has been very interested and engaged in identifying sort of what the appropriate level of engagement and appropriate role for the park district landowner um, and as an operator of shoreline properties. Um, and uh, so we have been participating in uh, various planning efforts uh, throughout the shoreline. Um, the Hayward uh, shoreline is sort of one piece to the puzzle of, of, of a number of different adaptation strategies that are being um, worked on uh, throughout the Bay Area. And they're really all following the same um, planning process uh, established by adapting to rising tides, which is a, a process that has been developed by uh, BCDC, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Um, and uh, really uh, just about every segment of the shoreline um, is being looked at in, in one of these steps, um, whether it's through early scoping or assessing conditions, um, starting to define the risk or really planning for what that response would be. Um, the Hayward shoreline is, uh, we're working on that plan step. So um, this is important for us to develop a plan to really um, establish what those individual actions can be. So then we can, um, we can work with our legislative affairs folks, um, our grants folks, um, and others to start pursuing um, those partnerships, um, funds, uh, legislation, et cetera, that's necessary to actually move into implementation. Uh, we are working in partnership on this one with the uh, Hayward Area Shoreline Planning Agency, HASPA. Uh, this is a joint powers authority that currently um, is comprised of the Park District, the City of Hayward, um, and the Hayward Area Park and Recreation District. Um, HASPA was originally established in 1970. Um, the, uh, the agreement uh, was renewed in 2018 um, and really shifted the focus of the agency to focus on sea level rise adaptation. Um, and of course, Director Waspy serves as the Park District's uh, representative on the board of the HASPA trustees. Um, HASPA did develop a, a vision, a shared vision plan in 1993, so it's getting a little bit dated, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's the plan that kind of covers that. Um, there have been previous sea level rise studies done that this plan is uh, building off of. Um, so the 2010 preliminary study of the effect of sea level rise, so that's where we started to actually analyze what the, what the effects of sea level rise on the uh, shoreline is. And in 2015, Adapting to Rising Tides did a specific uh, resilience study for the area. Um, and on the picture on the right, you can just really see, uh, without getting into too much detail, just really what the risk um, and the extent of flooding uh, would be of, of the shoreline. And that flooding um, impacts habitat at the marsh, but also uh, facilities such as Highway 92 or the Russell City Energy Center or various treatment marshes that are um, along the shoreline there. So in 2018, uh, HASPA was awarded a $509,000 um, SB1 climate adaptation planning grant to pursue the Hayward Shoreline Adaptation Master Plan. Um, and we worked uh, in partnership as that grant. Uh, I'll mention the Park District uh, through that same grant program was also awarded $375,000 for the Bay Trail Risk Assessment and Adaptation Prioritization Plan. Um, that's currently in development. Um, both of these plans really emphasize nature-based adaptation strategies. So this is really how can we work um, with the Bay, with the Earth, um, to identify strategies that um, don't necessarily harden the shoreline, though that might be necessary in some places, but how can we really emphasize nature-based strategies that uh, maximize co-benefits to provide for public access, restored habitat, um, and infrastructure protection. Uh, um, and so I'll just mention both of these uh, projects this project and the Bay Trail Risk Assessment and Adaptation Prioritization Plan um, has really been led in, in a great fashion by Chantal Alatori, um, a planning a planner in our group uh, who has been um, leading the Park District on both of these efforts and, and led, the, led the grant application for the, for the RAP project. And um, just wanna thank Chantal, she's done just a really great job on both of these projects. 
So the goals here, uh, create a resilient shoreline for people and ecology, um, enhance the shoreline environment mm -hmm. to, to infrastructure and built assets, build shoreline resilience in the resiliency in the community and uh, improve the capacity for future generations to adapt to climate change. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt Grawl who can actually get into the, the details and the science of the plan. Um, and Matt, I'll just go ahead and advance the slides for you so you can just let me know when you're ready. Thank okay, you, Brian. Thanks. I was reacting to that photo of the uh, the high wave on the shoreline. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Matt. Yeah, um, well, um, good afternoon. Um, Matt Grawl, Chief of Stewardship. Uh, thank you, President Corbett and members of the committee. Um, look forward to talking more about this project today. So we've been working on this for over a year um, with uh, the project team um, being led by the city of Hayward and Hard um, through HASPA. And we just wanna use this map first to show kind of the overview of the areas we've been looking at. Um, it shows sort of the extent of the project area and the north, the boundary appears the Oraloma wastewater treatment plant. Um, and then and to the south, um, we have highway 92. Um, and then the inland line, th these boundaries are really based on the HASPA jurisdiction. And so then the inland line runs on the inside of um, the eastern, eastern edge of the ends at the city of Hayward um, in the industrial area of the city of Hayward. So it kind of cuts through an industrial area of the city of Hayward that's included in this planning area. Uh, we also have um, important infrastructure um, throughout the project area. Um, at the north, we have our, our marshes, the Oraloma Marsh. Um, and then just south of the Ormaloma Marsh, there's um, several landfills in, in, uh, uh, in this planning area. So we have the Alameda County uh, landfill, and there's also a city of Hayward uh, landfill. Um, so both of those facilities will need some level of protection in the future and could affect how we manage our properties and other areas. Um, the other important infrastructure is the Hayward Wastewater Treatment Plant as we move down the shoreline. And then adjacent to the Hayward uh, Treatment Plant is our Cogswell Marsh. Uh, another very important uh, area of habitat uh, for an endangered species and for protection. And then below that, we have the Hayward Marsh. Uh, and that's the area where we recently approved the contract to work on uh, restoring this area and um, restoring the Hayward Marsh and um, connecting it to the uh, Cogswell Marsh to the north and the Hard Marsh uh, to the south. And so as we move forward and looking at these alternatives, that's something that's gonna be very important to the district is to maintain and preserve that habitat of the Hayward Marsh and really um, protect it and pr provides uh, resiliency. Uh, and then farther down, um, the important infrastructure is the um, hard um, facility, the Shoreline Center um, at the Hayward Area uh, Recreation District Shoreline Center. It's very important for um, education groups and interpretation of the shoreline and um, also is, provides a great access point into the trails and the marshes. So that's our study area. And um, Brian, go to the next slide. And so this really shows the timeline of what we've done over the last few months. Um, we um, began the project just with an analysis of the existing conditions, um, the stakeholder and developed a stakeholder engagement plan, and then started with some online surveys. Then that uh, led into some more analysis, the development of sea level rise maps, and then also a groundwater mapping analysis to see how groundwater um, rise, rising levels could impact sea level rise. Um, and then we put all that information out again online and started ha had a series of stakeholder meetings. And um, we shared that information at the stakeholder meetings. Um, those were hosted at the Shoreline Center uh, with a, and a, variety, a number of agencies were uh, invited to that and, and many uh, sent representatives. And there were also uh, members from the public that attended those meetings. Um, and they were very well attended um, initially um, with the, the first larger meeting. And then the second meeting, we also had an, another stakeholder meeting to talk about design strategies. And I will go through the design strategies um, very specifically, but the main categories were these nature-based strategies that were the, gonna be the primary focus in the plan, engineered strategies, and then also some non-structural strategies. Uh, and I'm gonna go through those in detail in the next few slides. But now what we've done and where we are now is we've combined all these strategies into several design alternatives. Can and I so I'm gonna also describe three design alternatives and those, one is a more near shore alternative, then there's a down the middle alternative and then a far inland alternative. And this is where you establish that line of protection. Matt, um, can I ask within a the question? Line. Yes, sure. Um, on the timeline for the, the uh, in input from the stakeholders groups, yes. I know it's on this chart, but I'm sorry, I can't read it because it's so small. Can you just refresh my memory when, when that was, when we had um, that? Well, we had one after the sea level rise modeling, which was last fall. Um, okay. 
and then um, later in the, well, actually it was late summer, and then last fall we had another workshop related to adaptation strategies. Okay, thank you very um, much. And the last one in the fall and adaptation strategies was around the time of the fires um, that we had okay. to close our, I remember we had to close our parks because of high wind and, and fire danger that day. Okay, um, thank you so much. And so then we've also, I think one thing I haven't mentioned, we've, we've also been presenting this material at the HASPA meetings and getting uh, feedback from yeah. the trustees um, yes. through HASPA. And we've had individual stakeholder meetings with uh, many agencies, um, BCDC, yeah. Caltrans, um, primarily the two important ones, really important ones about Alameda County Flood Control or Loma Sanitary District and the city of Hayward that all have very important infrastructure in the plan area. We've had multiple in-person meetings with their staff. And then we've also had meetings with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, also another Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. I should have mentioned them a little earlier. They've been very involved in the stakeholder meetings. We've had individual meetings with them too. So, um, and, and, we're, and this, is, this is another part of that process. Um, and so what we'll talk about at the end is we're still gathering feedback on these preferred alternatives. This, this meeting is a part of that. And then we're, we're having an online forum that goes on for about another, another few weeks where people can go online, look and get more detail. There's a lot of informative videos that we'll show at the, I mean, the link to where those are at the end. Um, and then people can comment through that process. And that's still ongoing at looking at these alternatives. Um, and then all this will be presented again to HASPA uh, at the next meeting um, and looking again at these design alternatives and what we're, where we're leading towards the preferred alternative. So um, okay. I'll take the next slide, Brian. Thank you. Okay, so here are the nature-based strategies we've been looking at. Um, and so uh, fine and coarse grain beaches is something we've been looking at. And, and when I go to the next slides, we'll show where we're talking about applying some of these techniques. But coarse grain beaches is similar to that top photo, the upper part of this photo um, on the far right side, see that coarse gravel there. That's what we're really looking at for this area to protect those shorelines um, and use uh, large rock, um, but not necessarily smaller than, well, I should say small to medium sized rock, uh, uh, sort of uh, larger than gravel, but not as big as riprap um, to protect those beaches. And so to provide this rock um, base that would help pr protect the uh, shoreline levees, but then also um, would provide some um, habitat benefits to that rocky shoreline, but also some limited potential recreation, but very limited. This isn't a beach where we'd be attracting people to it. Just a, it would provide a more gentle shoreline though. Uh, we're also looking at tidal marsh restoration within the project area. Uh, that's going to be a highlight of the plan. This is one of the main strategies that will be used. Um, one thing that's also being looked at is diked pond management, um, converting some of the salt ponds or some of the other areas in the property to better store stormwater. One of the biggest challenges in implementing these scenarios is going to be what do we do with all the stormwater that needs to come from the city through the levees um, out to the bay and how do we um, address that with the marshes and how do we address that with the levee system in place. Um, also fine sediment augmentation, that's gonna be a key part of tidal marsh restoration and make keeping our tidal marshes resilient. Um, there's not enough sediment supply coming into the bay in this region to sustain the marshes um, in perpetuity. So we're gonna to need to do some level of augmentation um, to, and that can either be by pumping, um, that can be bringing in by barges. And one um, unique thing that's been discussed with Alameda County Flood Control, they're interested in piping sediment from Don Castro down to the Hayward Marsh at some point. And they've done a feasibility analysis. It's extremely expensive, but they've determined it's much, it's more feasible for them to set up a piping system through the flood control channels and down to the marshes rather than um, trucking it all out of Don Castro and, and dumping it somewhere. So we may be looking at more strategies like that for other locations as we look at what do we do with all the sediment trapped behind these uh, reservoirs that we need to get down into the bay to provide resiliency and protect habitat. Um, we're also going to be looking at tributary connections to the baylands, the streams that used to flow through the area, and that will tie into the stormwater um, that I mentioned with management. And then reefs and living breakwaters and eelgrass restoration. These are two um, important habitat elements, but they're not going to provide a lot of sea level rise resiliency. They may provide a little, but they're going to need to be done in combination with the marsh restoration, the uh, coarse grain beaches, and some of the levee improvements to really make it um, work. Those, will, those two reefs and living breakwaters and eelgrass restoration are not gonna be featured in the next slides, but we're uh, planning to include those in any of the three alternatives that are selected because they just have good additive value, um, but not providing that structural um, protection needed. And so next slide. So we're also looking at engineered strategies. Uh, I think one that will be featured prominently in the next uh, designs is ecotone levees. Um, we're looking at using our levees as creating ecotones. Uh, the bottom uh, right picture is gonna show us an example of that. Um, it's taken from the top of the levee, so it doesn't get a good um, perspective of the slope of that marsh plain below. But the idea is creating a marsh plain or a vegetated area, uh, similar to a riparian habitat or riparian vegetation along the edge of the levee. So you have some up and refugia, 
and then some marsh and uh, other uh, habitat at the bottom to protect the levee. Uh, and so th those are the strategies we would like to do. But in many cases, areas we have to have levee improvements that will meet FEMA standards to address um, the flooding issues. So we will have to have some traditional FEMA certified levees, but in the designs, we're looking at partnering those with ecotone levees so that we can have an ecotone levee adjacent to a FEMA levy to create more habitat benefits. Um, we may also may need to do some traditional revetments, um, as we see on the top, just either rock riprap or sheet pile. Um, those are techniques we're looking at uh, around some of the um, landfills and things like that. Uh, we're gonna need to improve tide gates and water control structures um, to manage that stormwater and to manage our marshes. There's also gonna need to be adaptation for the wastewater treatment plants, um, basically the city of Hayward and also Oraloma. And then we're gonna need to really look at land elevation. This is more in the city of Hayward area um, and land elevations for the buildings and the built environment there in the upland areas. Um, and then also the San Mateo bridge landing is something else that it will need to be addressed in any of these scenarios. Um, and also subsurface drainage and how we manage subsurface drainage. And that subsurface drainage is, is primarily in the industrial developed areas. And, and as ground level um, waters rise, um, there's gonna be need to be some um, relief of getting that subsurface water out of the area. Uh, next slide. And then we're also looking at non-structural strategies. These are things like the uh, modifying access in the Bay Trail over time, uh, moving it um, as it becomes um, hard to maintain it. As you can see on the photos on the right, this is the typical, the top is a typical condition of the Bay Trail, uh, but the bottom was a king tide um, last year. And so um, in king tides, we're seeing many areas that were just the Bay Trail is going underwater in some sections. Uh, and we expect that to continue. Um, and so over time, we're gonna need to retreat um, in some way. Um, we wanna still keep it as close to the edge of the bay, but we may need to go to the inside of a marsh or the inside of another area. To, and that's what some of these alternatives will consider. Um, we're also gonna need to look at the, how the marshes and mudflats will migrate over time as sea levels rise and, and then manage that retreat. So we will need some level of interior levees and sediment augmentation to maintain those marshes and to maintain that sort of non-structural strategy there to protect the areas, but not necessarily build um, more infrastructure. And then um, there's gonna need to be a relocation at some point of the Hayward Shoreline Interpretive Center um, or a modification of it. So it's gonna need to either be raised on piers, put onto a barge or moved to another location. So the plan looked at various opportunities to relocate that center. And then also as mentioned earlier, the building scale strategies, we need to look at certain, can certain build, buildings be elevated or retrofitted to be able to um, handle some level of sea level rise. Next slide. Okay, so here are the three alternatives we're looking at. Um, just want to use this to give an overview um, of the alternatives, but after this slide, I'll go into the more detailed discussion of each of these alternatives. Um, so there's the closer to the bay alternative, um, which shows the line of protection um, going around Hayward, uh, Orloma, and then through um, the Orloma Marsh. It also cuts off a portion of the Hayward Marsh at the bottom and then ends at Highway 92. Then so we've got the down the middle approach, which, um, put some of the levees um, in the southern half down, straight down the middle, um, and then um, cuts off um, an eastern portion of the Hayward Marsh. And then the further inland, it puts all the levees, the farthest inland they can go, um, and then, um, and it puts a line of protection uh, far inland, and then it, and it puts it on the far eastern edge of both of our marshes. Um, okay, next slide. And, and Matt, yes. the, the red lines are what you're yes. referring to in that last map as Ex the, yes. as the left line. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's the line of protection, that dark red thank line. And it'll be more evident in the next slides uh, with, we get a little bit better resolution. Um, so here are just some of the highlights uh, from the closer to the Bay approach. Um, as I said earlier, the north end of the project area ties back um, or wraps around or Loma wastewater treatment plant and ties into the San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo Creek channel. Um, and then it protects Orloma wastewater treatment plant in place with that levee. Um, it then cuts through the middle of the Orloma marsh and ties back the high ground of the two existing landfills. In the south, the alignment then follows the western edge of the oxidation ponds and cuts immediately south through Hayward and Hard marshes. Um, and it also would raise access, it raises the access road also along State Road 92 and it ties back the high ground at the intersection of Clawwitter Road in, in 92. Uh, and the, this line of protection places a larger extent of marsh inland of the line of protection, where it's less vulnerable to sea level rise. However, it's going to create a lot of challenges for managing these marshes uh, because you're going to have to have tide gates, those yellow structures at the top on Orloma, those would be uh, structures that would have to be managed to then and managed very um, 
carefully on a regular basis to maintain the marsh habitats and it would also change the habitat of the marsh by managing with that muted tidal and those managed culverts. And over time, we think that could have some real impacts um, to that, those marsh environments and we would have a real change in habitat types there. Uh, we have a much more diverse and, and, and better habitat at the Orlama Marsh when it's in a natural environment. Um, and I, another concern about this is that cut, putting these FEMA levees through these marshes um, and on district lands, um, these are very expensive. Um, these are infrastructure that require a lot of maintenance um, and a lot of um, work to, to put in and, and to maintain. And, um, and they would also be, um, they would have to be FEMA certified. And so I think as we move forward, I think our, we're leaning towards pushing these, these, these facilities off of district property uh, and, and away from the marshes. But we'll talk about, I'll talk about that in the next options of why that is, is a preferred approach. Um, but this will also, one good thing about this approach, and, and this also includes the other places, this ecotone levee I want to put out is in front of these FEMA levees. So that dark green line in front of the red is where that ecotone levee would go. Another problem with this approach is it cuts off our, our um, we have to, we're gonna have to build an additional levee around um, the ponds of the Hayward Marsh to protect the Least Turn Island and others in this. So um, that would it, it create some additional infrastructure. And I think the, also the long-term um, one the problem or one thing with this plan is the bay trail as we can see, as we see now is the bay trail is that dot, hat, dat, I'm sorry, dotted line along the edge of the shoreline. That dotted line over time would migrate to uh, uh, the edge of that FEMA levee. Um, as we start getting, it starts getting inundated and as the sea level rises and the marshes shift from mud flat to more of a low marsh, um, the bay trail would need to move at some point. Okay, so uh, next slide, Brian. So the down the middle approach, um, this pulls the, the line of protection back along the um, Union Pacific Rail Corridor here. Um, and also um, changes how we would look at um, the Frank's Tract area. Frank's Tract is just below Orloma Marsh. And this looks at using this area um, for some level of, of stormwater storage here. And this alternative, um, that's the, the triangle that you're seeing just um, south of Orloma Marsh. Um, and then this um, also ties into the high ground, back into the high ground of the two existing landfills. And then follows the western extent of the oxidation ponds to the south. Uh, this alignment also pulls back in the southern portion of the site and cuts through the middle of the Sarmar Marsh Harvest Mouse Preserve, and then ties back along a new levee along the access road for um, State Route 92. Um, it also, this maintains a larger extent of the tidal habitat while still reducing the risk to critical infrastructure. Um, I think the, the one the thing that we, we like more about this approach is that it, it leaves the marshes in, intact. Um, but one thing I think we staff would like to add to this is some more interior levees uh, within the Hayward Marsh or and potentially within Oroloma Marsh to protect these marshes over time. Because uh, to put this into context, these are, it's a 50 year plan. And potentially, depending on the um, amount of sea level rise, in, in the next 50 years, these marshes could start being underwater if we don't do something to raise them. When I was talking earlier about the techniques of the sediment augmentation, um, it could also be helpful to build some levees um, to provide some protection uh, to the marshes, but, but not necessarily FEMA certified levees. Uh, these would be just interim levees that would provide protection for 10, 20 years while we augment the sediment and raise the level of the marsh. Um, so they would be more a short to midterm solution to prevent the sea level rise um, while we allow the marshes to adjust. Um, Matt, before yes. you look at this slide, sure. where where where's the railroad on this map? Um, it's hard to see. Um, That's just generally it's, speaking. It's generally along that dashed line on the boundary, at least at, okay. the, um, um, at Oroloma Marsh. It's just there between Skywest Golf Course and the Oroloma Marsh is right where the, the railroad cuts through. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure exactly how it goes through the city of Hayward, um, but it stays uh, inland in the industrial areas a little bit more. It's not as close to the marshes except that up at Orloma. So, but so it is, it, it, oh, um, so, sorry, go ahead, Director Rosario. So, <laughs> uh, uh, you're saying that the, uh, the alignment will cut the middle of the um, salt marsh harvest mouse preserve. Will there yes. have to be mitigation for that? It would require mitigation. And Absolutely. do we have, uh, and what do we know? What kind of mitigation uh, we're talking about? Well, it would be we would need to build more marshland, more hay, you know, expand 
an area similar to the Hayward Marsh or the Oraloma Marsh or Cogswell Marsh. Um, that would have to be part of the trade-off and part of that design process would be where can we um, expand or create more marsh. Mm. Uh, I mean, the plan is looking for those opportunities at things like Frank's Tract or there's some old salt ponds out here at the Oliver salt ponds that could be restored to marsh. That's actually, that is being contemplated in this alternative. Uh, but there are some risks to that. I mean, the salt pond habitat there is very, provides a good habitat and a different type of habitat. So, I mean, that's being considered here, but it's really, um, we think we would like to probably not do that um, as, as get rid of this salt pond head. We'd try to maintain the various types of habitat here. So there will be these trade-offs though in this plan. There's gonna have to be some trade-off of conversion of habitat types or conversion of industrial land or, or other things. So Matt, the yes. stakeholders we've been talking to so far, do they include people whose infrastructure may be impacted by, uh, you know, inundation? And rise? Um, well, we, yes, I mean, well, there's certainly the city of Hayward and, um, and Calpine um, and other sort of large areas. Um, as far as the industrial business owners, the city of Hayward has been doing a lot of, um, you know, outreach to those stakeholders um, through what their website, the through their city what? newsletter. What about the railroad? Um, and the railroad, we've tried, and we're still trying. Um, we don't have a good contact. We've we've tried several contacts, and we haven't gotten a good response from the railroad. Do we do we know if uh, railroads in general have some sort of um, have have we heard not specifically for us, but do we know our railroads invested in protecting their infrastructure and areas where sea level rise is occurring in general? Do we know that whether they're looking ahead and investing in protecting their infrastructures anywhere? I will just say, I know um, the railroads were very engaged in the resilient by design process for um, the Northern Contra Costa County shoreline. So uh, mm -hmm. Hercules and Rodeo um, and uh, particularly the Capital Corridor Amtrak um, was mm -hmm. concerned about um, the rail lines that go through there. And uh, I don't know about the status of UP and some of the others, but uh, but I know, like I say, Amtrak was, was really engaged in that process. You'd think they'd have a, a vested interest and perhaps could be engaged yeah. as partner to help support the projects. Yeah, Director, Director Corbett, I think they, they definitely do and are um, the interesting thing about the railroad yeah. is that their rights are so uh, strong that they just dump more rock wherever they need it. Uh -huh. Remember, they've got the train to can fill a whole car full of rock and dump it along mm -hmm. the edge. And so that's yeah. one of the issues. They keep doing that over time and doesn't always fix a problem, but adds to a problem because they just right. dump more rock. Yeah, and there's other impacts. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Brian, we can go to the next slide. Okay, and so then this is the further inland approach. And this um, pulls back more, uh, again, along the um, Union Pacific uh, Railroad Corridor. This also cuts back along Frank's Track now. And so it goes on the backside of Frank's Track, um, tying into the landfill. And then the western edge of um, the Hayward Marsh is protected, and then it, protects the entire salt marsh harvest preserve intact in this area. Um, and uh, I think some highlights of this, and this will likely be coming is one thing on this is very different is this green line through um, the Hayward uh, treatment ponds. Um, that is contemplating uh, an alternative use of those ponds. Um, it's something that's being considered, but uh, Hayward has more immediate needs for those areas. So that will likely not move forward. Uh, but this is contemplating the idea of running stormwater through those at certain times and treating it during the um, um, dry season um, or, or, or when they have less needs for wet weather discharge from wastewater, um, but then also allowing wet weather um, wastewater to be go, go through this area and then come through an ecotone levee. That's going to have some real design challenges in the city of Hayward um, is really looking at what to do. I'm not sure exactly what their preferred alternative is now, but I think in some ways I know in early meetings they like the middle line of protection. Um, I think I, the district, I think this has some benefits of moving the levees far inland here. One, we don't have that FEMA certified levy on our property. Um, and it's something that will be very expensive to build and really likely should be built by others because it protects other others' property. Yes. Um, and um, and also I think, but one thing that's missing, I think in this far, further inland alternatives, we will need some interior levees 
to protect our marshes in the short term, in the midterm, I would say, maybe over the next 20 to 30 years, the sea level rises, sea level really starts to rise. And we're really gonna need to do in some intensive sediment augmentation. Um, one thing, as I was trying to be brief on these, I did not point out all of the alternatives include a gravel beach. That's the light brown line along the edge of the shoreline. So it's adding these gravel beaches all along the area. Um, and that's in addition to the riprap levees that are there currently. So it, it would help pre preserve them in place. Uh, but it's also the one thing that's uncertain about this is this technique is, and uh, as I say, many of these techniques um, and the challenge of a 50 year plan, many of these things are um, just concept ideas or have only been done in pilots. And so we've, there've been some gravel beaches that are in design and being implemented now. They're, they're gonna be doing one near um, Alameda Creek. And that um, area uh, is, uh, you know, they just, they're just now putting it in place in the next few years. I mean, they're just going through the permitting process right now. And so we're gonna need to see how those perform and we're gonna really need to understand what the long-term maintenance cost is and, and how often do you have to augment that and add more gravel? And does that become a feasible solution in the long term? I mean, we don't expect to be adding gravel every year, but is it every 10 years, 20 years? How do you maintain those areas um, to keep them self-sustaining? Um, and so those, and that same thing goes to the sediment augmentation um, that's been done at, at more sites than gravel beaches, but it's still um, a lot to be figured out. And um, these ideas of pumping sediment from a reservoir, that hasn't been done, but, um, but some studies have been done and there seems like a lot of opportunity. And we're gonna really depend on a lot of those strategies to protect our marshes under this, but also, um, I think this puts, like I said, most of the built infrastructure on county property with the landfill and then the FEMA uh, levies on, on city of Hayward property for the most part. Um, the next slide really shows all three alternatives again. And so if we wanna go back to that, maybe talk um, about the differences between the three or open any questions or really feedback and thoughts on the alternatives at this point. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, board members, do you have any questions? Do you want to leave the maps up for a moment? I can't see you. If you would like to speak, just uh, please state so. Uh, yeah. Okay, Director Rosario, <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, Matt, um, on the last, well, actually, both the middle and the further, the, the number two and three, uh, it seems to me to be more beneficial to have. Uh, more marshland to absorb um, uh, sea level rise. Do you have, a, um, is there a sense of what, how much, uh, how much the marshes would uh, absorb? Yeah, I think the, the problem is gonna be the sea level rise and then also the rising groundwater. And so when, when you combine mm -hmm. those two things at some point, and I don't know the exact time because I mean, it, the, you know, sea level rise is changing all the time. But over the 50 year horizon, at some point, these would start converting to mud plants. Um, mm -hmm. And so we would, the, it would just basically the marshes would become underwater. Um, and yeah. so that's why I keep talking about needing to raise those marsh plains or do something to protect them. Because if we don't do that, they will not be able to hold and capture that water. We're going to need to raise that elevation so there's more um, you know, porosity in the soil and more ability to store, store water. And we'd also, um, I think one thing is we we need to look at some of these how the stormwater comes through these levees. I didn't really I talked about that early on in the strategies, but stormwater will need to come through these areas and get out to the bay. And so when we look at the long term cost for all these alternatives, that becomes very expensive because there's going to, to be something to pump the water through this levee and then through the marshes. But that um, you know that same infrastructure though may be able to be used in some ways to manage water flows in the marshes. But that would be part of a very technical design process. Wow. And then uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the need to maintain all the, um, the gates uh, and water controls, that sounds, that sounds like it's also um, maintenance heavy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's our concern with um, the closer to the bay alternative and then also the down yeah. the middle to the alternative. Because um, the down the middle alternative, if you look at the bottom, those those um, squares, those are part of those water control infrastructures. And so that would be right in the edge of the hard marsh and the salt marsh harvest. The edge of the Hayward Marsh, hard marsh and the salt marsh harvest mouse preserve right there in those kind of on the edge of those marshes. You know, Matt, I had a question about that too. The That area that would manage the waters, that's almost like, I mean, who would do that? It's almost like you'd have to have a whole new utility. 
Yeah, I mean, flood control is certainly in many areas um, very concerned about this. And so they, I think, are, are you know, and some of the, they already have some of these structures, but they're really looking at what the needs will be. And as any FEMA uh, flood control levy goes in and, and depending where it's constructed, they may have that responsibility, but it also then could fall to the cities, um, um, in, not in this area, not necessarily the county, but in other parts of the Bay, it could be a county responsibility, but it's really gonna be the entity that, you know, owns the infrastructure and has the responsibility for keeping water from gathering on their property. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we don't have a lot of that on our property at the moment um, because most of these things go through, you know, right now are going through defined flood control channels. But as the waters rise, it's going to be harder to get that out to the bay, and it's going to need more pumps and more management. So who, I, I, I see print on that site, but I can't read it because it's so small. So who does actually uh, own that property where that screens, the green line is, the squiggly line? Um, um, so, oh, the squiggly line on the, the further is, inland? Isn't, isn't that where you said? where the, Yeah, that's uh, the city of Hayward. Um, okay. that, that's, that's the city of Hayward. That's part of their um, oxidation ponds right now. Okay. And so, so that was proposing an alternative to um, creatively reuse those to allow stormwater to come through there at yes. certain times yes, sir, yes. and do some treatment. I, 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 from the early conversations, the city of Hayward wastewater treatment folks weren't ready to go that route. And they, they just have some more operational needs for that area now um, mm -hmm. that make that infeasible. Okay. Hmm. I believe, um, but I, I have to let the city speak for themselves, but I know I've heard that from some city staff, uh, but they are still, they're in this review process right now. So we'll know more uh, of their um, thoughts in the next few weeks. Well, I would imagine that the dollar signs for that would be pretty high. Yeah, um, the dollar signs for all of these are very high. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 we did some very rough cost estimates um, of what they could be. And the, the further inland gets up to, um, close to a billion dollars, um, mm -hmm. it is a, a little over a billion dollars, but then the closer to the Bay alternative is about $700 million. So, um, and they all have huge O&M costs and there's huge uncertainties with all these things. And so when we took it to the city of Hayward, they said, well, it's in 50 years and it's gonna have to be, um, you know, all these agencies are gonna have to come together. We're gonna need other people's money. So let's try to do as much as we can and let's go for the further end. The cost doesn't matter because this is 50 years from now and we're gonna need to raise all this money anyway. So and we don't have any of it to begin, right? Or you know, very much of it to start. So let's go for the, you know, the biggest thing we can do, and then we'll try to, you know, if we can't get the money, adjust our plans over time. The longest so, term solution is that what they're looking at? The longest term solution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think there's also strong consensus among the council members to they were very interested in protecting the Bay Trail and the marshes. Um, I was very heartened to hear that, that there was this real enthusiasm from the council members of how important this area is for the habitat and the recreational values. That's great. That's very good news. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, Director Rosario, do you have any more questions? Uh, just one other question is, um, uh, if, if nothing is done, what would the, what would the uh, cost of the damage be to the to existing infrastructure? See, that's a great question. Um, we didn't calculate that, but that has come up before. And I think we'll make sure when we give our next round of feedback back to the consultant team to have them look at yeah. that, because I think that's a great point to put all this in context. Um, yeah. I think it, it could be extensive for the wastewater treatment plants that lost, especially the landfill to the cost. The district, I don't think there would be much of a financial loss, but there'd just be a major loss in habitat. Um, and mm -hmm. if nothing was done. And so putting numbers on that may be harder, but I mean, we just had some of the last uh, the really strong reserves for California Clapper Rail and, um, or I'm sorry, the Ridgeways Rail now, and uh, California Least Turn and Snowy Plover have great nesting success out in this area. So, okay. I mean, that's just a, a great refuge for the Bay in this area. And so we would be losing all of that. And uh, maybe we can put a dollar around on that aspect of it, but I know we can on the infrastructure piece. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a, it, it helps frame the question. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if nothing's done, and you have inundation further inland, I mean, I mean, what happens then? Do people just vacate those properties? Do mm -hmm. those eventually become marshland? Um, do those become new habitat? I mean, if nothing, if nothing is done, I, I guess those are all right. just things up in the air. Yeah, I mean, I think that starts to become a real reality. I think in the 30 to 50 year horizon, time horizon at some point, you'll start have ground levels, waters will be rising. There'll need to be some retreat 
Um, it's hard now to envision a managed retreat scenario uh, mm -hmm. because we would have to be, um, you know, raising buildings and other things that would be extremely expensive and politically unpopular. But as the impacts get more and more real, I think there's going to be a real need to do some of that and relocate yeah. and elevate and move things away. We as do. you know, the uh, the industrial base and commercial base for Hayward, their tax base is really concentrated along that southern area. Yes. And yeah. it's also, if you know that type of building, that's, you know, wall stack buildings. It's a flat concrete pad with concrete. Yeah, built ups. So they're low already. Um, and, and so they are very important for the commercial base for the city. Just want to uh, remind the board that a lot of our green ownership is actually owned by the state of California, it's state lands commission property. Um, mm. So th the only way that let's just say it, uh, a billion dollar plan is gonna come forward is, is for like a JPA between all the agencies and to be shared based on, on what their base of economics are because uh, if that railroad, which is a levy, if you think about a railroad, it's already a mm -hmm. levy. If that should fail and get flooded, that commerce isn't Hayward's commerce. It's the entire state's right. commerce. That railroad mm -hmm. is carrying materials to the Port of Oakland and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, the same thing is true with, with other facilities along that shoreline. I think uh, the leadership of the district to do this plan as a long-term vision uh, really puts us in a good position for planning, but there's there's really not any money. Even the Bay Authority dollars uh, wouldn't be large enough to pay for this plan. They could help uh, pieces of it and maybe habitat pieces, but this this is an industrial shoreline that happens to have a really big piece of marshland next to it, and it's got to be a state, federal, and, and the regional level of funding for sure. Yeah, and Director Waspy reminds us often uh, how important it is to make sure we engage those that are near this area because there's so many other businesses and there's so much other infrastructure that can be impacted and they should be also sharing in the uh, solution, uh, funding-wise and, and planning-wise. Um, and, and ongoing maintenance as well. Uh, yeah. I think that they all have an obligation to help fund that because uh, you also have to remember that there are several landfills, county and city landfills that were closed. They were not closed and capped on the, and that's garbage yeah. landfills. That's not yeah. just dirt and material, that's garbage mm -hmm. landfills with right. that leachate being encapsulated in those landfills should those get eroded away, that's a whole nother source right. of pollution and contamination. So right yeah. right there in our park and next to our park are, are landfills that are now I, being closed. That's the history of that entire shoreline. That's where the, yeah. the dumps, so to speak, used to be. Um, I, I also wanted to point out in that industrial area, and you've already mentioned this, it is an extremely important uh, economic resource to the city of Hayward. That's where a lot of the uh, biotech businesses are located. And, uh, you know, it's a it's actually known as a biotech cluster, one of the biotech clusters of the state. So yeah, that's, um, I hope uh, we're engaging um, all of them as well. And uh, so that they can be part of the solution. Director, um, we, oops, sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead, I, there's other questions. Uh, I was just gonna ask if Dr. Uh, Doctor, <laughs> Director Wieskamp, do you have any questions? You know, it's not so much questions, but <clears throat> unless the public is convinced of the value here, you're talking extraordinary amounts of money as I look through this. And they've got to be learned about it over a period of time, or it's just going to get lost in the shuffle. You know that. All these governments have their different issues and where they're going to spend money. And, um, I don't think it's an easy thing to do. Uh -uh. Not at all. I, I, I mean, don't abandon doing it, try it, but you've got to get the public involved and I don't think they are at all now. Very limited. Yeah, it's, it has been limited, I would agree with that. I mean, but there are some very interested and in, in people that are very interested in either marsh restoration or protection of the Bay Trail or they just use the area. So we have gotten, a, or people that are just interested in how marshes should adapt and, and we're adapting our land. So those are a lot of the, we're getting very interested invested people coming to the stakeholder meetings. But part of it, what we're doing now and what we'll do after the plan is 
preferred alternative is selected and we start developing these, these are supposed to be used, this adaptation master plan is to be used as an outreach material. And there'll be, there's a lot of analysis that's gone into getting us here um, as far as the sea level rise maps go. And I think all that can be really used to help educate the public about what the risk is here and what the impacts will be. So that's one of the real benefits of doing this level of planning is that we can e put real estimates and real you know, lines on a map that show people what's gonna happen. Um, it's also a good segue into the, where we are now with the, the project. So we have this website on, on the screen, the Hayward Shoreline Master Plan.com. That's where we're gathering feedback on the Hayward Regional Shoreline Adaptation Master Plan. Um, and so on that website, there are various videos um, about the, the plan. And then there's also uh, links to then provide feedback on the plan. So if you would like to do that, we're hosting it on our website also and, and putting out links um, to this. Same thing with the city of Hayward and Hard. Uh, we're all sitting and sending it out to our contact list to really try to gather more public feedback over the next few weeks. Um, and, and also we're you know, trying to get the public to, to engage um, in, through this, this platform. So okay. we, we'd actually hope to have a series of stakeholder workshops during the last month. Um, fortunately, we couldn't do those at Hayward City Hall and, and bring all the groups in. And we were going to have office hours for each of the key stakeholders and then a big community meeting. And so this is how we're um, doing those community meetings in the, in the virtual environment. Matt, have we enlisted the Hayward Chamber of Commerce? They have a very um, active, uh, you know, email, informational website online. They're doing all kinds of online educational programs during this time period. Hmm. Have we enlisted them? You know, they have a pretty major um, mailing list, so to speak, and they do a lot of outreach. And I think that they could help get the word out and maybe even host a Chamber of Commerce opportunity for this information to be shared. Mm. Okay, yeah, good suggestion. Um, that works out all the time. I, yeah, and I don't know the answer to that. I know they, like I said, they put it on the city newsletter and they've been doing other things to promote it through their sort of normal channels in the city. Um, but I will reach out to the city staff and ask them, um, I, I know their planning staff would, is connected to that group, so. Um, well, I don't think it would be a bad idea to contact the Chamber of Commerce directly. I know you pr probably have a protocol you wanna follow, but. Yeah. Um, we're members of the Chamber of Commerce, and um, uh, you know I think that um, this would be right up their alley. Okay, good suggestion. So, yeah, thank um, you very much. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work through Hayward staff, but wait a bit if, if they want us to reach out, then we'll, we can do that. Okay. Or we can do it jointly. And the last couple of things, I just want to say I very much appreciate the uh, nature-based approach, and I also think you know we show great foresight as a district in um, putting together a master plan as we're sort of the leaders in pulling people together. And I just think that that's really great. It shows, um, you know, really forward thinking on our part. So thank you for that. Anyone else yeah. on this item? It is an informational item. So if there's no other questions or, oh, I'm sorry, Matt, did you have anything else to share? No, we had a question. That's it. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Director Rosario, I'm sorry, I can't see you when the screen shares on. Oh. Let's see. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, do you know if uh, the city of Hayward, if it, is, if it doesn't happen already, are they contemplating some kind of a, a community financing district for that uh, part of the shoreline? Um, that has been discussed um, in, at HASPA. I mean, and the trustee from the city of Hayward has, has raised that idea and their planning staff has thought about it. Um, the timing and how that would be structured is, is just being thought about. I think in some ways they were hoping to use this plan as a vehicle to show some of the need and, um, and when the plan's done. It, and so that I, as we go into the preferred alternatives, those things, and, and we're at one actually, as, as, as we, I should say to wrap up, um, even though we already did, as, as we look at the preferred alternative that's selected in this process, we get the preferred alternative. There's gonna go a much more detailed analysis of that preferred alternative. And through that process, one of the things we'll be identifying short-term, mid-term, and long-term plan, things that can be done to implement the plan um, right away, and then what, and what would need to happen to allow those to happen. And there will be a section that talks about opportunities for financing. And I know that will be one option that will be discussed um, among other opportunities. Um, and so we're really going to try to highlight how we would finance the short, mid-term, and long-term um, aspects of the plan. And I should have mentioned that earlier. Matt, Sounds when we present great. these, excuse me, um, Ellen, I just, I, we're having a hard time. Um, Matt, will we be presenting this officially to BCDC? Have we asked to present it to their commission? Um, we have not asked to present it to the commission. No, we, 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 we met with their staff twice, had two in-person meetings and, and given them all the information we've had. 
And we've gotten a lot of good um, input from their planning and permitting staff, and they're very engaged and interested. Um, but we haven't gone to the full commission. I just think as the board members have suggested, the more we make this public to get that information out, that's a good public body. And I also may less of a public body, but still a very important one and owner is the State Lands Commission. And mm -hmm. so we, we may want to work through legislative affairs to provide something to them. Those are two very critical, obviously, pieces of the, not just the funding, but promoting the importance of this, this project. And I think the board members are really right to say, who else can we get on board in a, in a more public way uh, to get that yeah. information out there? Yep. You know, the water board is hosting a, a panel discussion on financing of these long-term solutions and, and the sea level rise and marsh um, projects. And so Larry is gonna be leading a, one of the panels and, and I'm gonna be on that panel with Larry Goldsman. Um, and, and, but the morning is gonna be led by Mike Montgomery from the water board talking about all the financing that's available now. And then we're going to talk about what we've done, what we're doing, and then what our needs are on that panel. And I'm planning to highlight this project as part of that. Um, and also talk about Dots and Marsh and many of our other successful projects we've implemented, but also talk about the needs for the creative financing. I'm really highlight. So as we get ready for that presentation, we'll talk more and I'd be appreciate any things okay. we want to highlight. I, I, I would uh, maybe think of some way to uh, shoehorn Lake Temescal in there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good, I, I think that's actually, oh, okay. I, I hadn't thought of it as creative, but I think it actually fits when we talk about yeah, it's creative solutions. Sorry to interrupt getting... again, but um, Lake Tem I just found out Lake Temescal is the only watershed within that water board's area. That's what I was told the other day. That didn't make sense to me. No. There's something unique about um, Temescal on the water board. I just was told by the executive director, so I have to, mm. I'll ha we'll have to find out more about that. I'll have to talk to back to the 1800s or before. <laughs> All right, um, Matt, thank you very much for a really great presentation, thought provoking, and uh, another on the list of things we're gonna be busy working on for many yeah. years. Thank you for that. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So um, our next item, and I'm, I'm do a quick little time check. It's, uh, what time is it? It's one, it's almost 1.30. And I know some of us have to go to EOC at, uh, uh, two o'clock, so time time check. But we have our next item, and then of course we will have uh, public comments. So our next item is our Park District Headquarters, Peralta Oaks North, a project update. And I believe this is going to be introduced by Deputy General Manager Al Ana Alvarez, joined by AGM Christina Kelschner and uh, Lisa Gorgian, who is our Chief of Design. Um, and construction. So please go ahead and uh, take the floor. <laughs> Thank you, President Corbett. Good afternoon, members of the board and esteemed members of the public and colleagues. Um, Dr. Dr. Ana Alvarez, Deputy General Manager. It's another beautiful day to deliver the mission of the Park District. In doing so, we're here today to provide an update on the Peralta Oaks North project to renovate the building immediately across the street from our current administrative headquarters, which was acquired last year. The renovation of the building will allow for a true administration campus, adding value to the holistic approach of our work through design spaces that amplify a collaborative culture, which the one campus concept will foster. As a way of background, this is a project that the Park District began nearly 20 years ago to replace the current public safety building that has reached the end of its useful life and to provide additional administrative space needed to accommodate the park district's growth over the past couple of decades. The one campus, the one campus concept symbolizes and serves to unify the park district, given that an integrated public safety division with the park district administrative headquarters is a force multiplier towards the values of safety, service, and stewardship and correctly signals to the vision of the Park District. We bring this item to you today, recognizing that we find ourselves in unprecedented, unsettled and uncertain times. In time when our headquarters are occupied only by those providing essential services as part of the continuation of operations under the current shelter in place order. At a time when parks and open spaces are more critical than ever and the future of our economy is uncertain. This is also the time to reposition, to benefit from the economic downturn, as you will hear more 
at the upcoming Capital Finance Board Workshop next week. This is also the time when we are rethinking our workspaces to provide safe spaces for our employees to work and for the public to participate in person at our public meetings and visit our offices for services. So while staff has continued to work di diligently on this project, we did wanna take uh, just a moment to pause and speak to why staff continues to recommend moving forward the designing of a building renovation at this time, despite the fact that the world has literally changed since we last provided the board with an update. In fact, staff believes moving forward with the design work not only makes sense, but the timing is right. The project is well poised for success since our work is more critical than ever. The, it's important to note that the increased public expectations of our police and fire merit a modern complex with enough space and service capabilities to address the ever increasing demands in wildfire prevention and in keeping our parkland safe and available for everyone. An integrated public safety division only enhances our ability to respond, protect and mitigate from what has become a regular threat of wildfires. By the time we are ready to implement construction of the renovation, the design of workspaces will look very different from today with an eye towards creating spaces that speak to enhanced public spaces uh, within the headquarters of the Park District, collaboration within our culture of the Park District, efficiencies based on adjacencies of space, and certainly to sustainability in adherence to the policy of the board directors. The timing of this project is also right because of the market. The first phase of the project, the design phase, which you'll hear about today, is anticipated to take between one and a half to two years, hopefully a little bit less than that. But while the economic future is uncertain, we anticipate that being ready to go to construction at the time will only position the park district well to get competitive pricing in what the construction market is anticipated to be then. It is also important to note the framework for this project, which speaks to the values of the Park District of transparency and inclusion to ensure that all internal stakeholders will be heard. To accomplish this, we've created a project team that includes staff from all divisions, including several members from public safety. That team is led by your chief of design and construction, Lisa Gorgian, and project manager, Toby Perry. Additionally, uh, the project is shepherded by the Park District's executive team to provide decision support and direction called the Executive Steering Committee with the general manager and myself as project sponsors. Our AGM of ASD, Christina Kelschner, was assigned as the lead and the steering committee has been meeting regularly and is charged with looking at the one campus concept with both buildings and integration of the public safety division into the park district's headquarters. And with that introduction, I would like to turn it over to Christina to provide the board executive committee with an update. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, DGM Alvarez. As Anna has uh, mentioned, the public service that we provide to our community, um, as we've seen in the current pandemic, is more important than ever. And um, part of the uh, reason for this building is to provide um, safe spaces, appropriate spaces for the public to come and visit us and to receive the public services that are so important for our community. So uh, we do continue to believe that um, the time is right to move forward with the design of this building. Um, and then of course, we'll be back many times to the board before we would move forward with construction. But to move forward with the design and to understand uh, what the cost would be to renovate and uh, really start to work on what the needs are so that we can continue to provide uh, services to the public. The purpose of the project has not changed, although the world has changed. As I said, it just has become even more important. And um, we have at this point reached an important milestone which is that uh, staff has completed our interviews. We've put out an RFP, we've interviewed several firms and are ready to recommend a consultant team to the board. 
We're still negotiating the terms of the contract with that consultant team, and we hope to be able to bring that to the board at the next board meeting on June 16th to the full board for the actual award of the consultant contract. So what we have to share with you today is the process that we've gone through, um, an update where we are, and uh, to share with you the recommendation for the firm that we have selected as staff. Next slide, Lisa. And although we're in a unique moment in time, as Anna said, this project has been going on for 20 years. Um, uh, at that time, we recognized that we needed to replace the uh, current public safety headquarters building, which was purpose built in the 1950s as a Nike missile site. And I know the board is familiar with all of this and probably doesn't you know, need all the refresher, um, but we did wanna uh, just be sure that we reviewed that any members of the public are listening and uh, just remind everybody why we're doing this project at this time. Um, so over a 10 year period, we did look at 400 different sites. So the property search was extensive. Last year, we concluded that the building next door was actually the best value for the function that we need. It was the best value and also had to be um, the advantage of being able to create a centralized location for the staff and for the public who make use of our services. Next slide, Lisa. Um, and just a reminder that although we're talking about a building, this project is really about people. It's about our people, our employees who are out there every day, keeping the public safe, keeping our park safe. And that includes our um, public safety building, our public safety staff who are out there every day and making, helping the public feel welcome and feel safe in our parks. And they're also an important component of um, st our stewardship team in uh, protecting our natural resources. Uh, next slide, please. And then of course our lifeguards, such an important critical component of the public safety and the services that uh, the park district is able to offer to the community. The lifeguards are always are also housed in the current public safety building and badly in need in some, of some uh, additional space and um, upgraded facilities. Next slide. And then of course our fire department and um, many of whom are also working out of the current public safety headquarters and uh, of course fires have become a, a regular threat and the fire season is just around the corner. We've already started having some fires in our parks and throughout California and it's only June. So ensuring that our um, fire department has the communications tools that they need and the facilities that they need is becoming increasingly important. Next slide. So just a quick snapshot and again, I know the board is familiar um, uh, I could have put many pictures up here. Um, Captain Love provided me with several pictures. <laughs> he was only e too, too eager to comply um, to provide some pictures of the current situation of public safety. And again, I know the board is familiar, but I thought it'd be interesting to see some photos of what's happening now, right now in public safety while we're in the state of emergency. So the picture on the left I was particularly taken with, this is the communication center, it's the dispatch, the dispatchers. There's insufficient space. You can get a sense of how crowded is it, it is. Social distancing was not an option. Couldn't move the desks far enough apart. And so what you see here is a screen that was um, built by staff that's made of PVC pipe and a shower curtain in order to create some separation during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic to keep our employees safe. And then on the top right, um, this is the lifeguards office, which was taken over for the PPE station. And so this uh, has been our headquarters for all the PPE to, um, to apply to park staff and keep our employees stay safe. Um, this is where they were assembling kits of PPE to distribute um, throughout the staff. You can see on the right side of the cubicles where the uh, lifeguards work. Um, so just a, again, a huge thank you to lifeguards and public safety for um, providing that PPE um, system. And then on the bottom right, uh, this is our mobile incident uh, command center that you see there parked next to a portable building of which there are many at the current public safety headquarters as well as um, a porta potty which was uh, placed there last fall when we needed to do some repairs to the um, restrooms and has continued to be important during uh, social distancing and COVID-19 because there is in fact only one restroom in the building um, in a building that sometimes can house as many as 100 employees. Next slide. And just a current shot of our um, administration building. 
This is uh, the new building a renovation will be as much an administrative uh, headquarters space as it is public safety building. It will be very much a joint use. We have outgrown our current administration building. Originally, when we occupied the building, it housed 80 employees. Currently, it houses almost 200. And as you can see from the photos, and just as the board knows well, um, Michael McNally and the facility staff have done a great job of squeezing in employees and storage and meeting space to every possible inch of space. That approach um, was difficult before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and it's going to be impossible when our employees do need to go back to work. And we've probably all read the headlines that big tech companies are saying they're going to give up their office spaces and uh, employees are going to work from home permanently. That's not our situation. We are a public servant. We are um, a community service. And we need to have a facility where um, our employees can provide those services to the public. And so it's become more important than ever that we have the options to think about our space in a way that um, our employees can return to the office and uh, in a way that's safe. And public health officials are in agreement now that um, prolonged exposure during uh, in indoor spaces is at a higher risk than outdoor spaces. So we need to certainly pay attention to um, how our employees are returning to work safely and having more space is gonna be an important, important piece of that. Next slide. So in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Gorgian, our uh, Chief of Design and Construction to share with us um, the recommendation and where we are in, in the project. I will just briefly share some of the work that we've done to date. Since we purchased the building, we have done some site, um, site security and stabilization, which means we've made sure the roof doesn't leak. We've made sure the fencing is in good repair, lighting, issues like that to make sure that the building is secure and well taken care of. Um, and we've also established our internal teams. A lot of this project is going to be some um, decision making about what the functions are that we need and how we go about doing that. So we have established an executive steering committee. I lead that committee. And that's um, made up of assistant general managers of public safety, public affairs, operations, chief of HR, representatives from the GM's office, um, and also our CFO. Uh, so that's our executive steering committee. That um, steering committee has made some very basic decisions. For example, um, the public, the new building is going to house administrative staff and public safety staff. Um, the new, uh, the scope of the um, consultant's work will be to look at a boardroom and where we might have opportunities between this build, our current building and the new building uh, to invest in a new community space, boardroom space that has technological capability, enough capacity. Um, and so that's part of the scope that the consultant will be looking at. We did put um, some previous work we had been doing on the current building to modernize the current building and maximize our use of space in the current building. We've put that work on hold now that was a decision the executive um, steering committee made. So to ensure that the two buildings move forward together in tandem so that we're making um, the best use of our space uh, as a campus between the two buildings. Um, and uh, the scope will include a communication tower and it will include looking at how do we make the campus um, connected? How do we make the two buildings work together? And also um, sustainable design. What are, um, the costs and benefits of various options for doing the most sustainable design that we can do. So those, those are the basic decisions that the executive steering committee has, um, has made uh, to recommend. And um, other than that, the design and the programming of the space is really a clean slate. So although we use space programming that we had done uh, when we looked at other facilities, we use that in the acquisition phase as due diligence, just to make sure that the building could accommodate the number of staff, a secure entrance, some of the basic things that we needed. But we will be doing a whole new space programming, which is just the word for deciding who goes where and what facilities go where. It's a clean slate and we are starting that process once we get the consultant team on board. So I just wanted to reassure the board that um, we have not uh, move down that road and the, that is all that work is still ahead of us to do. We've also established a project team that um, 
that uh, kicked off in January, and that is a team that's cross-divisional um, and it has members that have been supported by their, uh, I'm so sorry, appointed by their AGMs, um, such as Patty Grishanik um, to lead our communications effort. Alan Love um, is uh, co-leading that with Lisa Gorgian, um, Devin Reef in planning, who is very familiar with uh, Oakland. He came from Oakland planning um, and many others, uh, representations from all different divisions. And they will be meeting, that project team will be meeting at specific milestones to be giving input to the process. So in February, just before the shelter in place, we did put out a request for proposals for consultant teams, including architects, engineers, designers. Um, and so although there's one consultant firm, there are 10, as many as 10 different sub-consulting firms as part of that, um, part of that consultant team. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa Gorgian, who will talk about our selection process and schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lisa Gorgian, Chief of Design and Construction. So I'm here to talk about the selection process. And uh, as Christina has just mentioned, she's given us a really nice overview and, and as well as um, Deputy General Manager, Dr. Ana Alvarez as well. So we, um, Christina mentioned that we've put together um, these two uh, um, committees. So we have uh, our executive steering committee and then we also have our project team. And um, I think when we were in front of you in, um, back in uh, December, and then again in March, we described as Christina just has those uh, cross-divisional team. And so one of the first um, two, two tasks for those teams were to develop a project initiation plan where we really built on um, those basis, basic premise that uh, the executive steering committee um, had provided to us as guidance and um, really scoped out, okay, so what, what are we doing and what are we not doing? And um, also worked on putting together a request for proposals. And so this was again, really pretty collaborative in terms of getting feedback from our project team and then also from our executive steering committee as well. So we felt that it had um, been pretty, very robustly vetted and uh, was a good um, representative, repre represented what we were looking for, for this project. So we issued the RFP in February Later that month, we had a mandatory pre-bid, pre-proposal walkthrough in the building. We had, um, I think, representatives from up to 11 different firms that walked through. We were, uh, the, the RFPs closed in March and we received seven proposals. And uh, we, um, in reviewing those, we identified four firms that we wanted to advance to then interview. And those firms were Indigo Hammond, Jeff Katz Architects, LPAS Architects, and Shaw Kawasaki. So uh, I'm going to, so the, a lot of screens open. So the, the picture that's on your, that's on, as part of this slide is a screenshot from Dr. Alvarez's um, computer during uh, the interview process. So we, uh, because of the shelter in place, we pushed back our, our interviews uh, several weeks to come up with sort of the best process for having interviews, recognizing that we were all sheltering in place. And, and so we embraced Zoom along as we are today and um, had those interviews via Zoom. And so again, this is just sort of a snapshot of, of one of the one of the slides that um, was being presented actually by uh, was being presented and you can see on this slide Dr. Alvarez, um, Jim Devlin who's our district architect, Ren Bates the capital program manager, uh, Toby Perry the project manager, and Alan Love, Captain Love uh, with public safety. Christina and I were also on the Zoom call but you can't see us. So um, that was this is the group that vetted the uh, proposals and then advanced with the interviews. And from those, uh, we are so pleased to say that we had consensus on uh, the preferred firm. And so this is Shaw Kawasaki, 
They are a local firm that have done uh, experience with public safety and administrative functions together. Um, I think mo perhaps most notably for the group, they uh, were the architects who renovated the building across the street, Alameda County Coroner's Office, and um, or the Alameda County building that also houses coroner's office. Um, so they have demonstrated local experience with the city of Oakland. They have demonstrated renovation experience. They are, uh, they have a national leader in public safety, uh, architecture and design. They also um, are very familiar with the city of Oakland and state of California, uh, sustainable uh, practices and sort of what sort of uh, architectural practices will be most appropriate for this building. And because most of their clients are public agencies, they have experience with um, both presenting in front of elected officials, but then also with neighborhood stakeholder groups and really have an understanding of how we can move forward successfully get, um, with public engagement as a component, you know, very significant aspect of this component of this component of this project. So I'm going to move ahead. This is another slide uh, from their presentation showing one of their recent office designs. And the intent here is to show uh, previous work that they did where working through a design process, they were able to maximize operational efficiencies while still addressing the safety needs uh, of the client. So here is a snapshot of our schedule. Uh, we are the big orange rectangle that says we are here. And uh, we showed you this schedule later uh, back in March. And I think actually we started it in December and then showed it in March. And then here we are progressing along. And uh, after having our interviews over Zoom uh, at the end of April, We've then uh, been negotiating with the architects on their scope and fee to refine that. And we will be coming to the full board. Uh, our, our intent, our hope pending your action today is on June 16th to recommend awarding the consultant contract. So once that consultant contract is on board, as Christina mentioned, then we'll be able to dive into the space programming and We'll come back to the board um, as often as needed, but certainly before the end of the year with an update. And um, just I, in talking a little bit earlier about the project with, with Christina, I thought it would be helpful just to share that this is this time frame is actually pretty typical for a complex building renovation like this. And um, to keep us moving, I think one of the, the really valuable things that um, the district leadership has done is to set up these committees ahead of time. So the executive steering committee and our project team so that we have um, the, the structure in place to help us uh, come together at decision points so we can make decisions and keep the project moving along on schedule. And I'm going to go to the next slide, except for I think I just accidentally, can you still see it? Uh, we see the uh, slide with the um, picture of the building, and now we see the cat the timeline. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so here is zooming out to the the project schedule for the duration. So as Christina mentioned, we anticipate um, these next, or I think Anna mentioned the next year and a half to two years to move through the programming and concept phase through design development permitting so that we'll be ready to go out to bid in the spring of 2022. During that time, we have several uh, points where we want to make sure to come back and engage the board. And we'll also next year be working with finance, um, to develop a financing plan and issue debt for the construction of the building. So, we have, I think, uh, we've been over this, but um, 
Christina mentioned when she was talking about the acquisition, we did receive financing in 2012 from the promissory notes. And so those were over just over 19 million. And we spent uh, just over 14 million on the acquisition of the building. So we have approximately 5 million left to get us through um, this design uh, and permitting phase prior to construction. So with that, that's the last slide. I'll turn it back over to Christina. And Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Christina. Like. Yeah. We are sort of running out of time as well, but thank you for the excellent presentation. Can I open it up to questions? Are we ready for that? And Lisa, could you take your screen down? Thank you. Yes, I am desperately trying to. Sorry. <laughs> So while we're doing that, um, I am going to have to jump off to attend EOC in, in about four minutes. But in the meantime, uh, I just want to ask um, Director Rosario um, if he has any questions and then um, ask if you will close out the meeting when I leave. So after this item, we have um, public comments board comments and general manager comments. So when I leave, will you take over? Yes. No problem. Yes. And this is an information item as well. So we don't have a vote on it. So thank you. Um, any questions, comments? Director Rosario and then Director Wieskamp. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the for this report. Uh, uh, it's very exciting. And I appreciate all the work that's been done in here. And uh, one, uh, one, uh, I really like the ideas of having the, the project teams and the steering committee. And I was wondering, uh, there's one, uh, there's one group I, that's being, I think is uh, being left out that's very interested in this building and that's the uh, board of directors other than the executive board. Uh, I know there's a uh, uh, interest in what goes into the building and I was wondering if there is a possibility of uh, board members being part of one of these teams, either the steering or the project team, uh, kind of like the, our ad hoc uh, with the, uh, the task, diversity COVID task force and uh, our other endeavors. I think uh, uh, it would go a long way to uh, actually streamlining the process uh, and we wouldn't have to wait a whole month uh, to, to get information or input in, into the um, uh, into the, the concept of the building. Um, thank you, Director Rosario. I was actually thinking along those same lines that it might be helpful to have an ad hoc committee of the board. Um, you know, obviously there's so many things we have to keep on track on the timeline and having to wait and to schedule a meeting within, you know, the already programmed meetings. Um, I, I think it would be a good idea in case there's some need for direction or to bounce things off board members. Clearly, this is a huge project and we have to make sure that we um, stay very close in touch with the entire board for you know, all important decision making um, and make sure everybody has a part in that from, from our group as well. But I very much um, support the idea of an ad hoc committee. I think it makes sense for you know, things that may need some, you know, like I said, some bouncing off of um, as we move through the process. And I, I um, would very much like to do that to appoint a um, ad hoc committee. Um, and I think it's a good idea. So thank you very much. Any other comments, questions? Director Rosario and then Director Wieskamp. Are you done, Dr. Director Rosario? Yeah, I just had one more question. Uh, uh, Regarding the communications tower, um, how far are we along as far as vetting uh, the location of that tower? And have we talked with the community yet? Uh, thank you, Director Rosario. Um, I think we are not very far along. I think we have a consultant who's looking at that. Uh, Lisa may have something to add. And I also did just want to mention that uh, Captain Love is on the call and I had seen uh, uh, Chief Chibera here as well um, earlier, so they may have something to add. But Lisa, do you have an answer to that? 
Oh, good. Yeah. Maybe they can wait for the EOC to start for three minutes. <laughs> Give us three extra minutes. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Director Rosario. That's a great question. Um, I think as Christina mentioned, we, you know, it's kind of a blank slate. Um, we have some preliminary information, um, ideas just based on some recon that we did in order to provide enough information for the RFP. But that's uh, really something that one of the sub consultants of this architectural firm is a radio communications consultant and so engineering. And so we'll really be looking to them to help us. And I think, as I mentioned, this architecture team has, has done similar projects that are located in neighborhoods. And so um, I think we'll be looking to them too about uh, how we wanna engage with the neighbors because clearly that will be a very important component of this project. Yeah, we wanna make sure we use technologies that are safe and not intrusive as much as we can. Thank yeah, you. Plus we, don't, we don't want another Lake Chabot. <laughs> oh, God, no. Yeah, Correct. <laughs> Director Wieskamp? I can't believe that we're the only agency that's going to be very concerned with the air in the interior spaces of buildings. Are we talking or is somebody looking at con the consultant looking at, is there some way that we could perhaps face the fact of the virus and change the air more efficiently, cleanse the air in some way? I can't believe in the scientific community couldn't come up with something. Is anybody looking at it? Yes, so those are all considerations, Director Wieskamp, um, that will be looked upon by the project team and the architectural firm. There's many ways of renovating the building and taking advantage of the spaces. And certainly the new reality that the virus brings to our work will be reflected in the scope of work of the architectural firm. Absolutely. So they have that skill or ability yes. to look at it. Okay. Yes. I can't believe the greater community isn't looking at that. We're, as I said, any larger building is going to have to be facing this. Yeah, you know, I think it's going to be the new way of the world. It is the way, and I can't believe they can't come up with something. So I want to make sure we're taking advantage of it. But thank you. As always, we want you to move faster, but I know you're doing the best you can. And, um, Director, sure. Director Wieskamp, just a comment that we, as you know, we had a terrible situation with fires in California that we were sitting in a blanket of smoke for over, over maybe close to two weeks uh, or longer. And so that's something that we need to be looking at as well as how do we filter so we'll be looking at the, the most modern, the, the infrastructure in that building, both the wiring, the technology and the HVAC all have to be redone. They're very outdated. So this is something that we would definitely charge uh, uh, forward to, to look at both smoke inhalation coming into the building, but also uh, any, any potential virus or future virus. I, I just briefly wanted to say is, you know, two things have really changed. Uh, since we started this a year ago, one, the virus, we were looking at the new building, but the old building is now very clearly that those cubicles are too close together. Mm -hmm. So even, even reoccupation of the existing building is going to be challenged because we can't fit as many people in that were there before the virus. It's just, you can see it. It's just way too close together. So that's another challenge. The other challenge is that 5 million remaining in the fund is what we have. Uh, this is a huge uh, construction project, reconstruction, modernization project. So we're a long ways from uh, bringing to the board a budget in the source of money. Uh, we know that we can't use Measure WW money. We can't, this is not a high priority for any grants. So this is our, our problem to, uh, to fund. And I just want to express that caution with the economy um, that while things may get cheaper, uh, the, the ease of finding the money is going to get harder. The usual conundrum. Okay. Okay. Dee, it looks like you're, you're in charge. It looks like I'm in charge. Okay. So, um, 
Anything further on that subject? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys. EOC oh. just automatically linked in. I didn't even have control over it. It just popped okay. me in. But um, thank you very much. I just want to say I support moving forward. I appreciate the selection of the architect. It looks like they have some great experience for what we need. And um, I'll see you all later. Thank you very much, Steve, for taking over. All right. You're bye, welcome. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So uh, was there any closing comments by uh, Christina? Do you have anything else on the... Uh, nope, just thank you to the board for your support. And uh, we look forward to coming back to you later this month with the uh, consulting contract. Great, thank you. Great work, everyone. Um, and so that leaves us at public comments. Do Becky, do we have any public comments? Uh, we have no public comments at this time. Great, thank you. And board comments, Director Wieskamp. I am good, I, I thank you all. It's going to be an arduous task and it's good to have Bob be, making us be realistic about money and all that, all that. Yes. Everything is grounded in money. Oh, um, down to money. <laughs> I, I just have one um, uh, kind of follow up to uh, an agenda item that was on the uh, that we deferred to um, at the last executive board meeting was the naming of Concord Naval Weapons Station. Where are we? Have we made contact with any of uh, the Native American groups regarding the name? Uh, Director Rosario, I don't believe Brian is still on the call. So um, I know that we are in process of that and we have made some connections um, with the Native American group. So those conversations are happening. Right. I don't know that we have any conclusions, but the conversations are happening. Excellent. And then uh, just as another comment, I was at a uh, uh, fundraiser for council member Dan Kalb and it was brought up that, uh, I guess we heard from the ninth circuit panel that uh, they overturned the city council's ban on coal. And I believe that's uh, going to go to the full uh, court. So uh, any support you can give on a personal level? Go um, out and do it. So, Director Rosario, we are involved uh, in that as well. Um, so uh, we can have uh, council uh, give an update on that. We um, we are participating, not directly, Great. but uh, we, we have sent letters. Excellent. And with that, uh, General Manager, any final comments? Well, I think the, the obvious concern with both of these, you had two very, very significant big ticket items on this agenda today. Um, the, they are both a heavy lift. Um, I really do think it's wise to do the planning and move forward with the best possible alternatives and, and be ready. Um, but in both of those cases, they are unfunded, I will call them unfunded mandates. <laughs> both for climate change and for the real need. But I, I am uh, very concerned about the condition of the public safety headquarters as well as, as and the importance of the role they're playing during COVID, but also um, just the, the ability for us to repopulate the existing building and get back fully back to work. Um, we're still figuring that out. As we've said many times, we're, we're building this airplane and trying to fly it at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, just that caution that we are in for some economic turmoil, in addition to all the other turmoil that seems to be going on around us, and we'll we'll do our best to navigate through that. Great, yeah, I appreciate everyone's work on on that. Um, and if there are any without any other comments, uh, we can be adjourned. So thank you all very much for and uh, stay safe, stay well. And be kind. You're not on the road. Bye-bye. <laughs>